In this lecture presentation, we'll explore strategies for effective problem solving. This is based on your reading for the week, which is Halpern's Critical Thinking textbook, Thought and Knowledge, Chapter 9. As always, I recommend having the slides available so you can fill in the blanks and take notes as we proceed through the lecture material. Let's start with an introduction to problem solving. Starting with, what is a problem? A problem can be thought of as a gap or a barrier between where you are and where you want to be. That is, some kind of gap between the initial state and the goal state. In order for it to be a problem, there must be some challenge with knowing how to arrive at that goal state. We refer to these different paths as solution paths, different ways that the problem might be solved. So again, a problem is really a gap or a barrier between where you are and where you want to be, and you don't know how to best get to your goal state. Problem solving depends on what we know about the problem, and these are often referred to as the givens of the problem. Givens are basically information or rules that place constraints on the problem. These can be explicitly stated or implicitly assumed. Oftentimes we need new knowledge or some kind of new insight into the problem in order to effectively solve it. Problems can be differentiated between well-defined or ill-defined problems. A well-defined problem is one that has one correct answer and at least one correct path to get there. All multiple choice tests are examples of well-defined problems. An ill-defined problem, however, refers to problems where there are multiple correct answers and or multiple paths to getting to that goal state. One of the issues with ill-defined problems is that it's hard to determine if the problem has been successfully solved or if there are strategies that might result in a better solution. An example of an ill-defined problem as compared to a well-defined problem in an academic setting would be a short answer or an essay in which you're never quite sure if you've perfected it and, of course, the clearer the grading rubric, the more well-defined the writing assignment. Most real-life problems are ill-defined. That is, there's no singular correct answer or path to getting there. For example, what is the best strategy for solving the problem of wanting to have a date with your coworker, or improving the environment, or making your business more successful? You can see how these are challenging not only to firmly determine what the goal state is, but to evaluate and decide what the most effective strategy for getting to that goal state might be. There is disagreement among psychologists as to whether problem solving is done in qualitatively different stages or if these stages overlap. In any event, we'll discuss what are considered to be the stages of problem solving. Starting with preparation. Preparation involves familiarizing yourself with the problem, the goal, and the givens. The correct solution can't be generated without an adequate understanding of the problem and the givens. Once a person feels prepared, they can move to the production stage. Production refers to the generation of solution paths. This involves brainstorming and listing all of the possible ways of getting oneself to the goal state. Following production is evaluation, which is the stage in which you'll judge your solution paths and identify the best choice. The final stage listed, the incubation stage, is not always part of the problem-solving process. Incubation refers to taking time off from the problem. It's a particularly important step if you're struggling to solve the problem, feeling worn out, too stressed out to think clearly, etc. Often, when we're trying to actively solve the problem, we sometimes feel stuck and sometimes overwhelmed by kind of beating our heads against the wall and unable to solve the problem. When we take time off, sometimes a solution occurs to us seemingly out of the blue. Insights like these may feel like an aha experience where your thoughts fall into place and you have a new sense of clarity about the problem. These aha experiences can happen during an incubation period, but they can also happen while actively working on the problem. 
In terms of the effectiveness of incubation, it's hypothesized that taking time off can help with problem solving because the time off dissipates fatigue and allows you to get out of a thinking rut. It might also be that selective forgetting or tip of the tongue phenomenon because our working memory becomes too taxed, so a break might allow those thoughts to come to the surface. This is one of many reasons why it's always a good idea to work on things before the deadline. That way, if you need time off from the problem, you'll have it available to you. There's also implications for taking exams. It oftentimes makes sense to skip challenging problems and come back to them later. What students oftentimes experience when they try to answer the questions in order is that they'll spend a lot of time trying to answer a challenging question and then won't have enough time available to answer the questions towards the end of the exam. It therefore hurts their score more than helps it. Sometimes in seeing the future questions, the answer to the earlier question becomes clear and then the person can go back and answer it. As far as test strategy goes, I always recommend that students put in an answer, even if it's just a guess. That way, if you don't have time to return to the question, you at least have the opportunity to get those points by chance. As we learned in the probability section, there's a 20% chance of guessing correctly on a five item multiple choice question, and a 25% chance of guessing correctly on a four item multiple choice question. It's always worth guessing. The research consistently demonstrates that one of the primary factors that is highly correlated with successful problem solving is persistence. Persistence refers to the determination to continue with problem solving despite difficulties. It is very often the difference between giving up and finding an effective solution. Persistence can be very challenging as it requires significant patience, the ability to shift course, and to remain open-minded to new solutions. Many people refer to this type of persistence as grit, which is a term that was coined by Angela Duckworth in her book of that title. Grit refers to this passionate persistence, and while it's a relatively newer term, it's something that has been around for a long time. I do want to note that while the research does show that persistence is an important factor in influencing problem solving success, there are many other factors that also play into problem solving, many of which are not within our control. I want to be quite clear when I say that I recognize that there are many inequities in terms of environment, stressors, access to resources, and a variety of other factors as well. Even the most persistent person may not be equipped to achieve what a less persistent person with higher means might achieve. Quite honestly, I debated including the concept of grit in this lecture because I think that the message that failure is something we should feel personally responsible for sets marginalized, oppressed, and underfunded communities in particular to blame themselves for the systemic inequities that are beyond their personal control. With that said, I would be remiss to discuss problem solving and not comment on the value of persistence. Ultimately, we all benefit from persistence and grit, but that does not mean that challenges in achieving goals should be viewed as personal failures. We should all do our best to try our hardest to achieve what we want in life, but we should also recognize that social, economic, and racial inequities absolutely play into our successes and failures. One aspect of persistence and grit that I work with my clients on quite a bit is figuring out if the goal is personally important and meaningful. We don't want to put all of our time, energy, and other resources into solving problems that aren't particularly meaningful to us. It's also important that we stay open-minded about changing our minds. Changing your mind can be a solution in and of itself, and it's a perfectly valid one if the goal loses meaning or priority over time. Everything is not equally worth our time, energy, money, and other resources. As I stated, it's essential to be mindful of the contextual realities and the factors that are beyond your control. It's so important that we treat ourselves with compassion and that we engage in self-care so that we can take care of ourselves over time and become successful problem solvers in that process as well. 
If you find yourself struggling to cultivate persistence and grit in your own life, I encourage you to reflect on what you really want to achieve in your life. It's so much easier to meet challenges with grit when we're personally invested and have a strong sense of purpose, meaning, and passion. So do your best to balance your desire for achievement with compassion for yourself. If you're doing your best, you have every reason to feel proud of yourself and to treat yourself with kindness and compassion. If you wouldn't respond to a loved one the way you're talking to yourself, it's a good sign that you need to reevaluate your message. As the saying goes, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. This quote has been attributed to Buddha, but there are many solid sources that claim this was not a quote from Buddha. So while I would love to credit the author of this beautiful quote, it is not clear who the original author is. Those of you who enjoy pausing the lecture presentation to view the videos should pause here to view the video, Grit, the Power of Passion and Perseverance, so you can hear firsthand from Angela Duckworth how she conceptualizes grit in the realm of problem solving. Beyond life circumstances, there are several other obstacles to successful problem solving. First, let's look at mental sets. Mental sets are shaped by our past experiences and refer to the problem solver's state of mind. We have an unconscious tendency to approach problem solving based on our previous experiences. Basically, we tend to try to solve problems using strategies that have worked in the past, and we have trouble thinking of novel solutions to familiar problems. This imposes limitations that restrict the possibilities for solving the problem. In many cases, breaking set may be important in finding a solution. With that clue in mind, I recommend pausing the lecture recording to view the video Lessons from the Nine Dot Problem. The other example of mental sets beyond the nine dot problem is the ping pong problem, which is a great example of worldview constraints. The riddle goes like this. A ping pong ball one inch in diameter falls into a three inch length of pipe that is one and one eighth inch in diameter. The pipe is firmly affixed to the concrete pavement. It is extremely important to remove the ball. You and some friends are faced with this task. All you have is some fine wire and your collective abilities to solve the problem. What do you do? I can tell you from teaching this course many times in person that the most common answer is trying to finagle something with that fin wire to get it out, making it into a spoon or poking the ball in some way, none of which would really probably work in this situation. This is a perfect example of how we become limited by worldview constraints, which refer to the ways in which our outlook on life shapes the options we consider as solutions. Essentially, worldview constraints refer to how we get stuck in mental sets based on how we see the world. While people often say to bend the fine wire into tweezers or to poke the ball somehow, the better option is to pee into the pipe and watch the ball float to the top. People in our society don't often think of this solution because it's socially inappropriate and therefore never occurs to you as an acceptable thought. However, in remote villages and areas where it is normalized to urinate outside, this is an immediate answer. It makes perfect sense and it would work well. This speaks to the importance of brainstorming and analogies, which are strategies we'll talk about later in this lecture. The next obstacle to problem solving that is similar to mental sets is referred to as functional fixedness. Like it sounds, functional fixedness refers to being fixated or stuck on a usual function of an object. Let's look at two examples of functional fixedness. First, the two strings problem. Two strings are hanging from the ceiling of a room that is empty except for a rusty stapler, three paper clips, and a pair of reading glasses on the ground. How can you reach both strings at the same time? You might pause here to give this some consideration. The answer is to tie one of the strings around the stapler, swing that string now that it has something heavy attached to it, while you then go to hold the other string. When the string with the stapler comes near you, you can grab it at that point. 
Now you're holding both strings. Once you hear the solution, it's relatively obvious, and a lot of people wonder, how did I not come up with that? The reason is you don't think of a stapler as being a heavy object that lends itself well to being tied to a string. The next example is Dunker's candle problem. In this case, you have a book of matches, a box of thumbtacks, and a candle. How can you affix the candle to a cork board so that you can light it? This is another one where people come up with very creative solutions that oftentimes wouldn't work in light of the constraints of the problem. For example, a thumbtack would not be able to go all the way through the candle to the extent needed to affix it to a corkboard. The answer is to dump out the thumbtacks from the box, affix the box to the corkboard with the thumbtacks, and place the candle inside the box, which you can then light with the match. Again, once you know the solution, it generally makes quite a bit of sense, and people often wonder how they were unable to come up with it. Again, functional fixedness is at work here. The box in a person's mind is a box of thumbtacks. It already has a job, and that's to hold the thumbtacks. If this riddle were posed with simply a box rather than a box of thumbtacks, it would be very unlikely for someone to get caught up in the functional fixedness aspect of thinking of the box as being utilized as the thumbtack holder. When faced with functional fixedness, the generic parts technique can be very effective for resolving our tendency to get stuck thinking about an object in terms of its usual function. The generic parts technique involves two questions. First, can this object be decomposed further? That is, what is it made of? Second, does this description imply a use? And if so, could it be used in another way? Considering the features of the objects can make it easier to realize, for example, that staplers are heavy and could be easily attached to the string. Considering how the box of thumbtacks can be further decomposed would make it obvious that there is a box that could be part of the solution. The next obstacle to successful problem solving is irrelevant and misleading information which refers to any aspects of the problem-solving process that is extraneous to the problem itself. That is, any information that's not useful to solving the problem and or that might throw the person off when trying to solve the problem. This information may be intentionally misleading or unintentionally misleading. Either way, irrelevant information can lead the problem solver down dead-end paths. In real-life problems, we commonly need to decide what information is relevant and what can be disregarded or ignored. This is one reason why it's important to be clear about our goal state to avoid being misled by extraneous information. Let's start with the socks riddle as an example of irrelevant and misleading information. If you have black socks and brown socks in your drawer mixed in a ratio of 4 to 5, how many socks will you need to take out to make sure you have a pair of the same color? Now often when I do this riddle in class, I watch students furiously scribble on a piece of paper trying to solve this mathematically. The answer is actually quite simple. It's three. Because any more than two and you're sure to have a match. The ratio is irrelevant. Three socks when they're only two different colors means you'll have at least two of some color if you pick three. The Rice Krispies riddle is Kate's mother has three children, Snap, Crackle, and Blank. Do you know what the blank is? Many people here will say Pop, which is true. Snap, Crackle, and Pop are the three kind of mascots of the Rice Krispies brand. However, the answer is Kate. Kate's mother has three children. One of the children must be Kate. This is a good example of misleading information and mental sets because your existing expectations tricked you if you answered pop. When it comes to problem solving, there are context specific strategies that we'll discuss in a bit. And there are also more generalized strategies that work in a variety of contexts and are referred to as transcontextual strategies. 
Transcontextual strategies are those plans that can be used in any context with any sort of problem. All problem solving begins with having a clear understanding of the individual's goal. Therefore, one overall transcontextual strategy is to spend significant time reflecting on the goals, often via brainstorming. From there, it's important to state the goal in a variety of ways. The person will consequently explore more solution paths, and this in and of itself increases the likelihood of finding an effective solution. So let's start by talking about brainstorming as a very effective transcontextual strategy. Brainstorming is particularly useful for generating solution paths. To effectively brainstorm, it's important to write down all of your ideas, even the most wild, unusual, and imaginative amongst them. Allow time for insights to present themselves. Try not to rush the brainstorming process. The more ideas you have, the greater the likelihood of solving the problem in a successful way. Keep in mind that after brainstorming, you can evaluate your options in light of constraints. That will occur during the evaluation stage. You'll likely need to consider factors like cost, time, ethics, resources, etc. Analogies are a common form of inference that can be used to facilitate problem solving. Analogies involve noting similarities and comparing those similarities to the current problem. It's most effective when there's similarity in structure rather than content. There are many types of analogies that can be used in the various problem solving stages. A personal analogy is when you want to figure out how to solve a problem and go about picturing yourself as a participant in that problem. I like to use this strategy for solving interpersonal conflicts. If each side of the conflict can imagine how the problem appears to the other side or to the other person, new solutions can become apparent. It also tends to facilitate empathy and compassion, which is always a wonderful outcome. Next, the direct analogy. In the direct analogy, you compare the problem you're working on with problems that are similar in another domain. Many inventions and innovations have come from direct analogy. For example, Alexander Graham Bell used his understanding of the ear to invent the telephone. The top of the glue bottle was actually designed based on the function of the rectum. And dental glue is based on how barnacles adhere in wet environments. One specific form of direct analogy is referred to as biomimicry, which is innovation inspired by nature. Those of you who like to pause the recording to view videos might pause here to view the video Biomimicry, Problem Solving with Nature. Nature is used to inform problem solving in many ways. It has shed light on strategies for green, sustainable living. It's also led to important innovations such as the aerodynamic Japanese bullet train that was designed based on the shape of a bird's beak. We'll discuss biomimicry again in the next lecture on the topic of creative thinking. Another strategy that works well for all problems is consulting with individuals who have more insight, experience, and or skills in other areas. This might involve consulting an expert in a particular field, or it might involve creating a group to work on the problem together. Groups can be excellent for problem solving because collective intelligence and creativity of many people nearly always trumps an individual's intelligence alone. In terms of groups, the biggest concern is the influence of groupthink, a problem we discussed in the Introduction to Decision Making lecture. To avoid groupthink, each member of the group must feel safe to voice unpopular opinions. And in order for groups to excel at problem solving, members, and particularly leaders, must be sensitive to the needs and abilities of all group members. Another group approach is referred to as crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing involves posing a problem to a group of individuals, often on the internet. Crowdsourcing is a valuable approach because it attracts people with a broad range of information, knowledge, and experience. It also involves working on the project individually, so the members working on the project are not subjected to the drawbacks of groupthink.
Visualization strategies are another excellent example of a transcontextual approach to problem solving. Good problem solving requires the evaluation of many factors and visualization can help us evaluate all of these factors. Visualization might involve writing information down, drawing some form of a graph or diagram, and manipulating models. These are helpful because they help with the problem in a more concrete form, and in doing so, reduce the load on working memory and allow you to see the problem visually. It also makes it easier for you to take a break when needed because the information's there when you decide to return. As far as writing it down goes, two approaches that are quite common are taking notes and journaling. This could include writing down all of your ideas, journaling to better understand your values, or your alternatives, or your goal state. It might also involve making an outline for your paper so you feel clear about the structure and what areas you need to perhaps research or seek out advice to complete. Graphs and diagrams are particularly useful when there are complex interrelationships that are important to the problem solving process. Flowcharts can help you identify problems in the strategy that need to be addressed. Hierarchical trees are particularly useful when the information lends itself to some kind of hierarchical arrangement. For example, therapists use a strategy known as a genogram, which maps the family out so that the client can see patterns in their family. Estate lawyers also use family trees so that they can better understand, for example, how to divide money that is left in a will. We discussed using a table format to help facilitate good quality decision making in the previous applied decision making lecture. A table can also be used to determine the statistically correct move in a game of blackjack, as you can see in the image to the far right. Tables and matrices overlap quite a bit, but whereas tables can have rows only, matrices must have row groups and column groups. Matrices are used, for example, by consumer reports when they provide data of products such as computers and cars. They might present comparisons between, let's say, five different types of cars based on factors like gas mileage, price, and technology. Manipulating models is particularly useful for seeing things in advance and for trying new things. When there's a lot of risk involved, for example, if you were to build a shopping center, you would really want to spend time making sure that everything is arranged in an ideal way because once the buildings have been built, you're unlikely to be able to move them. That's why when shopping centers are being designed and housing developments, there's oftentimes an architectural mock-up where you can see tiny little buildings and trees and the pool and everything that they are planning to put into the complex before they start building. Manipulating models is also useful for deciding how to arrange something in a house. For example, the picture at the bottom is of a modular couch. Now, this isn't a risky problem, but the pieces of the couch are heavy, so you might want to use blocks to decide how they might look best in your room or how the different pieces could fit together rather than actually changing the arrangement of the couch before you know how you want it to look. Another type of problem where manipulating models comes in handy is for a detour problem. You can try this out yourself by pausing the recording here to view the video can you solve the bridge riddle? And I'll give you a clue, it is easier if you try to use models to solve it. Detour solutions involve problems in which an intermediate step is required that is opposite of the goal. Otherwise stated, the path to the goal is not linear. In real life, this might look like a person taking time off from school to save money, despite finishing school being an important goal. Means ends analysis is a procedure of selecting sub goals and using them to progress towards the main goal. Essentially, it involves breaking down the problem into smaller parts known as sub problems that each have a sub goal that is smaller and more manageable than the main goal itself. 
If you can't achieve the sub-goal, it means you need to break down the problem into even smaller sub-problems with more achievable sub-goals. For example, a game of chess, the goal is to win by putting the opposing king in check. But first, you may need to take out other pieces. In real life, this applies to most major life goals. For example, if you decide you want to be healthier, you can't just decide to wake up the next day and be significantly healthier. You start by taking more walks, eating more vegetables, getting a little bit more sleep. Working backwards. First, let's do the example and then I'll explain. Water lilies on a certain lake double in area every 24 hours. From the time the first water lily appears until the lake is completely covered takes 60 days. On what day is it half covered? Now, you might have found this quite easy, or perhaps you're quite challenged by this question. If the lake is covered on the 60th day, and the area covered by the lilies doubles every day, then we know that on the 59th day, it must be half covered because that day it'll double. And by the next day, on the 60th day, the lake would be full. Thus, by working backwards, this problem is actually easy to solve. Working backwards is a good strategy whenever there are fewer paths leading from the goal than there are leading from the start. Another good example of this is doing a maze backwards. If you've ever tried this, I'm sure you've noticed that it's always easier if you start from the end. Random search refers to a problem-solving approach when there's really no systematic order for exploring possible paths. For example, you might use this strategy when completing a word search or trying to find Waldo. You might have an approach, but let's say you start at the top left-hand corner and you go down in columns until you find Waldo. But a lot of people just kind of scan their eyes across the page until he appears. That is, by definition, random search. Trial and error is a more structured approach than random search, because there is a systematic aspect to the strategy. Trial and error involves trying each possible path until one works. This is a fine approach if the problem is well defined. That is, if there is an identifiable correct answer that you'll know is correct when you come upon it. For example, if I ask you to unscramble H-E-T to form an English word, you could try all of the different combinations until you come upon the. Another example might be figuring out how to get a new couch into your third story apartment. If you've seen the Friends episode where they try to move the couch, that's what I had in mind when I came up with this example. Because there are very few options, trial and error works fairly well. But as complexity increases, trial and error and random search become less and less useful. Both trial and error and random search are poor strategies as the number of possible paths increase. Split half method refers to a strategy that involves systematically halving your search group. It's a good strategy when there's no information on the best way to begin searching among solution paths. For example, let's say there was no water coming out of your kitchen faucet, but there is water coming into the pipe from the street. You can assume, therefore, that the block in the pipe is somewhere between the street and the kitchen sink. But where? In this case, since you have no indication of where the block might be, it's best to start in the middle. That way, if there is water flowing at the halfway point, you can immediately rule out the area between the street and the halfway point. Next, you'd go halfway between the original halfway point and the kitchen sink. You'd continue splitting the halves until you find the source of the clog. If you're interested, you can try this yourselves with a friend or family member. Have them choose a number between 0 and 100 and tell them you can guess it within seven guesses. All they have to do is tell you if it's higher or lower than each guess. In order to win, you have to use the split half method. Start by guessing 50. If they say higher, you'll guess 75 next. If they say lower, you'll guess 25. 
Keep guessing the halfway point until you get the answer. It's guaranteed in seven guesses or less. When it comes to problem solving, the strategies are not mutually exclusive, and it's often best to combine strategies. If the problem is ill-defined, it can be particularly helpful to ensure that you're clear about the problem and the goal. This will help you evaluate the solution paths for how well they fit in terms of your goal state. If there are a limited number of possible solutions, trial and error and possibly random search could work well. If the problem is complex, it might be helpful to break it down into smaller sub-goals, which is consistent with means-ends analysis. Analogies and visualization are also particularly helpful for complex problems. If there are fewer paths from the goal than the start, working backwards can be a helpful approach. If there's a line of equally likely alternatives, the best place to start is in the middle, which refers to the split half method. If there's a lack of solution paths altogether, brainstorming and consulting with experts and or widening the discussion to other people you know who may have other areas of expertise or experience could be very helpful to finding a solution. If you're stuck, visualization is an important step that will allow you to safely take time off from working on the problem, which is the incubation stage we discussed earlier. It may be that you need a break to rest your mind and allow that aha moment to occur. If you haven't tried all of the problem solving strategies, it may make sense to give these a shot too, such as the generic parts technique for functional fixedness. Ultimately, Persistence is the most important quality when you encounter a problem you can't quite figure out how to solve. Either you keep working towards a solution, or you decide the problem is not important enough for you to solve, which may be a reflection of a shift in priorities, values, goals, resources, or something else. You might also come to the conclusion that the problem is not solvable at this given time due to a variety of circumstances. Short-sighted changes may lead to cognitive dissonance and other problematic outcomes. It's okay to change your mind, but it's always important to be honest with yourself about where that change is coming from. If the solution is not valued to the extent that it's worth the expenditure of your time and energy, you might find that channeling that time and energy into something else may be completely logical and warranted. Ultimately, the best solution is the one that maximally aligns with your personal goals and values, and that can certainly change over time.